very much. Uh, well, I would like to greet you uh, on uh, behalf uh, of uh, the Maltese uh, uh, Notaries uh, uh, Council. I will speak English, but in case you have questions, uh, I can only uh, answer in Italian. Anyway, uh, my presentation is basically going to be an overview of the regulations. I am supposed to have 50 slides, but Mr. Capiello has reminded me <laughs> that uh, we're going to have one minute per slide, so I'm afraid uh, some of the slides will have to be uh, skipped. But of course, uh, please feel free to uh, have access uh, to the presentation as a whole once uh, uh, my speech uh, uh, is over. <laughs> Okay, good morning. Um, we'll start by um, speaking about the field of application of the these two new regulations. So we're speaking about the uh, three regulations, one dealing with uh, matrimonial regimes, the other one dealing with registered partnerships, and obviously this in relation with the successions regulation, which we already um, have um, used for the last years. Okay, now these two new regulations, they come into the ambit of um, a wider um, sort of uh, European civil law, which is being built slowly. Um, uh, we'll make reference to the Council Regulation 4 of 2009 about maintenance obligations, and the Regulation 2001 of 2003 um, regarding matrimonial matters and uh, matters of parental responsibility, um, 1259 of 2010, divorce and legal separation, which is the famous Rome 3. And uh, so all the, these two new regulations, they are um, fitting in this uh, this jigsaw puzzle which we are building slowly um, we are trying to um, the European Union is trying to um, have a uniform um, applicab applicability of civil law for all the citizens which since we form part of one union naturally we should not be treated differently in different parts of the union so here you know the have the territorial application the president has already explained in his introductory words um, that the regulation, as you know, is what was not and obviously will not now um, be applicable in the United Kingdom. And uh, both Italy and Malta, um, we are, um, these two regulations in terms of Article 70 um, are uh, applicable to the regulation. So, um, as a general um, point of interest, um, we know that EU regulations have general applicability and applicability in, gen in a general and abstract way, ergo omnes. They are mandatory in all their constitutive elements. They are applied in their entirety. They are directly and immediately applicable in member states as soon as they take effect. So they don't have, they don't need an internal act of reception. They are uh, immediately applicable. So as soon as they are published in the Gazette, obviously, um, they are um, applicable immediately. So we have to be conversant with their contents. So if we can have an idea how these two regulations are divided. Um, they are divided into several chapters and um, they are almost identical with the, um, the division is almost identical with that of the succession regulation and that facilitates, um, facilitates the life of the practitioner because if there is a problem you can look how these three regulations together deal with a particular problem. So we have 73 recitals, 70 articles and then chapter one um, deals with the scope and definitions, chapter two with jurisdiction, chapter three with applicable law, chapter four with recognition, enforceability and enforcement of decisions, chapter five authentic instruments and court settlements, and then um, the um, usual um, transitory clauses. So we are accustomed by now to deal with European legislation, we know that we've got recitals and we've got the substantive articles. So the recitals, they, say, they set up the reasons for the contents of the enacting terms, the articles, and um, the point of interest, they always introduced by the words, whereas, 
um, they are numbered, and each sentence in the recital starts with a capital letter and with a full stop. This is what the uh, style guide uh, of the European Union uh, establishes. So we can distinguish, and we know why that recitals are not law, so we have to distinguish between, between the recitals proper and the articles of the regulations. Um, basically, the recitals are there um, to explain the purpose and the intent behind a normative instrument. They can be, can be taken into account to resolve the ambiguities in the legislative provisions to which they relate, but they do not have any autonomous legal effect. We have to be very careful. We cannot, um, um, in case of a discrepancy between, or a parent discrepancy between a recital and an article, obviously it is the article which prevails, okay? So they cannot displace the operative provisions of a legal instrument. They can only interpret the um, legal provision, but they cannot displace it. So what are the general principles? The regulations are inspired by the principles of unity and freedom of choice. They are confined only to private international law. They do not affect the substantive law decided by each member state. They prevent the same property regime from being governed differently in different member states. They prevent the reaching of a solution in one member state, which is not recognized in another member state. They provide for unified rules on jurisdiction, conflict of laws, and the recognition and enforcement of decisions. And of, there is no automatic mutability of the applicable law. Now, um, we know that the problem of these regulations, it's, they, some of them, um, unfortunately, they lack definitions. Um, and that's a problem. Um, especially in the succession regulation, we're already encountering some problems because the regulations, um, they are very um, parsimonious on, 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 giving, on giving definitions. And we are lucky that uh, based on the experience of the succession regulation, these two regulations um, have, are more generous in providing definitions. And that obviously helps us um, in, our, in our, not only academically, but it also helps us in our day-to-day -day, um, use of the regulation. So we have a definition of what is a matrimonial property regime which is defined as a set of rules concerning the property relationship between spouses and in the relations with third parties as a result of the marriage or its dissolution. We have also a definition of what is a material property agreement, which means any agreement between spouses or future spouses by which they organize their matrimonial property regime. The regulation does not define marriage, which is left uh, to the uh, definition established by the national laws. Okay, and that we've got an explanation for this in recital 17. As regards the registered partnerships, we have a definition of what is a registered partnership, meaning a regime governing the share life, shared life of two people, which is provided for in law, the registration of which is mandatory under that law, and which fulfills the legal formalities required by that law for its creation. So we can know from the definition that um, we have to be very careful about the de facto relationships, because if there is no registration, no obligation of registration according to the national laws, then they do not come into the ambit of the regulation. So we have to be very careful here. Um, we have also a definition of what are the property consequences of a registered partnership. Um, meaning the set of rules concerning the property relationships of the partners between themselves and the relations with third parties as a result of the legal relationship created by the partnership or its dissolution. And we have also a definition of what is the partnership property agreement, meaning any agreement between partners or future partners by which they organize the property consequences of the registered partnerships. Um, now, the, uh, the way in which forms of union other than marriage are provided for the member states legislation obviously differs from one state to another. And a distinction should be drawn between couples whose union is institutionally sanctioned by registration of their partnership with a public authority and couples in de facto habitation. While some member states of the union do make provision for such de facto unions, 
they should be considered separately from registered partnerships, which have an official character that makes it possible to take account of their specific features and lay down rules on the subject in union legislation. At the outset, the practitioner should be aware that the regulations distinguish between agreements on the choice of the applicable law and matrimonial property agreements, partnership property agreements. So there can be an agreement limited only to the choice of law, and that will be maybe the scriptura and etc., which we usually were accustomed to do before. The regulations consider a duality between these two institutes. As regards registered partnerships, however, some states um, do not distinguish between these two types of agreement. So as regards the temporal applicability, um, both regulations came into the force on the 28th of July, on the 20, uh, 20, 2016, and they are applicable from the 29th of January, 2019. So um, as regards recognition and the forcibility of authentic instruments, they, uh, this uh, regulations applies to all judgments and all instruments drawn up on or after the 29th of July, 2019, regardless of the date of marriage or of the creation of the partnership. Some conventions, such as the Hague Convention of the 14th March 78, on the law applicable to matrimonial regimes, may still be applicable in some countries and the relation to particular countries. Uh, for example, marriages celebrated in France between 1st September 92 and 29th of January 2019. So it's important um, that we check um, every, every, in every instance before. Um, we should not assume that it is that there, are, that there aren't any exceptions to the rule. So the matrimonial regime regulation applies to all marriages on or after 29th January 2019. Our marriage is celebrated before the 29th of January 2019 when a choice of law has been made after the 29th of January 2019. As regards the registered partnership regulation, it applies to all registered partnerships created on or after the 29th January 2019, to all partnerships created before this date and registered on or after this date, or to partnerships created before this date when a choice of law is made after or made applicable from, because we know that these regulations um, also provide retrospective applicability, which is um, a bit a bit of a problematic thing in my, in, my, in my opinion. The material application of the regulations, they apply to all um, material property regimes, uh, registered partnerships with a cross-border element. So it's very obvious, but there is no harm in repeating that these regulations apply only where there is a cross-border element and in our national um, ambit will continue to apply our own domestic laws. Uh, it applies to also to spouses or partners with the same nationality, but having habitual residence in different states at the time of marriage or creation of the partnership or of the drafting of the agreement, that determines or amends this regime. So you can see um, the, the difference. Also, it applies to spouses, partners having assets in of even one of the spouses in a state other than that or his of her nationality and or residence, or have concluded their marriage or their partnership in a state other than that of their nationality or residence. So even the mere fact of getting married in France, for example, by two Italian citizens, it will render this um, re regulation applicable. Spouses, uh, partners of different nationalities, regardless of their habitual place of residence, regardless of the location of assets or place of celebration of the marriage or of creation of the partnership. And the applicable law, um, it's, it's uh, one of the principal tenets that's got a universal application in terms of Article 20. And we learned that the law designated as applicable by this regulation shall be applied whether or not it is the law of a member state. And the same applies also in the succession regulation as we by now know. Thus, there is only one applicable law which is applicable both between member states and also with third states. Luckily, I would say these regulations do not provide for a renvoi. 
the applicable law applies to all property following under the regime, be it matrimonial or a registered partnership. Therefore, it applies to both movables and the movables, irrespective of the place where they are situated. So there is no judicial or contractual depassage is prohibited. Um, hopefully this afternoon I've prepared a very simple case which is based on this scenario. Third exceptions apply where the rights of third parties are involved. And there is no automatic mutability, no automatic change. Now, obviously, like all um, uh, laws that are worth in salt, then there is also a, an exception to the rule. So Article 27 in both regulations establishes that the law applicable to the regime shall govern, my emphasis in Teralia, the effects of the matrimonial property regime, the consequences of a registered partnership on a legal relationship between the spouse partner and third parties. However, Article 28 establishes that the applicable law cannot be invoked by a spouse or a partner against a third party in a dispute between this third party and either of the spouses or the partners unless the third party knew of or in the exercise of due diligence should have known of that law. This is obviously not to defraud uh, the rights of creditors. A third party is deemed to have no, had knowledge of the law that applies to the regime of the spouses or the partners against whom a dispute arises in two specific circumstances. And the principle of proximity, that is the law of the regime has a very close link, close link between the third parties and the spouses and partners. He should have, not in, in his normal due diligence, have presumed that this law is applicable because there is this link. Um, this proximity envisages three laws. The law that governs the agreement between third parties and the spouses or partners. The law of the country in which the contracting spouse, partner and the third party have the habitual residence. And the law in which the movable property in question is located. So. It, uh, in any one of these instances, subsists obviously the credit that third party should presume that um, there is this link. Well, the regime law cannot be enforced by spouses against the third party when the latter cannot be deemed to have had knowledge. There is a default applicable law. As regards movable, it is the law applicable to the agreement between the spouse partner and the third party. And as regards the movable or registered assets or rights, the law in which the movable is situated or the rights or assets are registered. Okay. And um, there is also another exception um, the application of a provision of the law of any state specified by this regulation may be refused only if such application is manifestly incompatible with the or public, with the public order of the forum. So the objection may be raised to a particular provision of the applicable law, but not to the whole um, applicable law. So for, for example, if there is a discrimination on grounds of religion or sex, or I think it's only that particular provision um, which falls and not um, the whole law. Um, there are also mandatory provisions in Article 30. Nothing in the regulation shall restrict the application of the overriding mandatory provisions of the law of the forum. The overriding mandatory provisions are provisions which are regarded as crucial by a member state for safeguarding its public interests, such as its political, social, or economic organization. Obviously, this is a very um, vague definition. Recital 53 then provides for rules of an imperative nature such as, such as protection of the family home, but we have always to interpret these in a restrictive manner. So um, I, 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 will, I will have to skip some slides, um, but uh, this, there is a scope of the applicable law in uh, um, the, the regulations provide a non-exhaustive list. Um, they do not say that these uh, uh, the applicable law um, applies only in these instances, but they say it applies in these instances and provides for other applications. And you can find that there are seven um, uh, principles. Then, uh, the main rule in terms of recital 43 is that 
the Matamor property regime here, we're dealing with Matamor property regime, not partnerships, um, is to be governed by a predictable law with which it is closely connected. So for reasons of legal certainty and in order to avoid the fragmentation of the matrimonial, matrimonial property regime, the law applicable to the material property regime should govern the regime as a whole, all the assets movable and immovable, irrespective of the nature and regardless um, of the state where they are situated. And we have a similar provision in recital 42 of the partnerships regulation. The determination of the applicable law in terms of Article 6 can be determined on, a, on an objective basis. And obviously, we also have here a um, professor which is as established in Article 22. Then we um, Article 26 applies the default applicable law where there is no professor juris, okay? Um, and there is um, an order, okay? It, first, it is disposes first common habitual residence after the conclusion of the marriage. Then if it's not that, it disposes common nationality at the time of conclusion of the marriage. And this is not applicable with there are civil, several nationalities. If this is not even applicable, it is the law of the state with which it disposes jointly, have the closest connection at the time of celebration of the marriage. And then we have the famous or the infamous escape clause, which um, creates um, some problems, but in times, at times it is providential because um, there are some borderline cases which would, couldn't be dealt with if there wasn't, wasn't this um, escape clause. And um, I, I don't want to take too much time on this, but you, we've got uh, everything registered here. Um, in the absence also of Professor Uris as regards matrimonial um, registered partnerships, I'm afraid, um, the law applicable to the property consequences of the partnerships is the law of the state where the partnership was created. And we've also here the escape clause, the court having jurisdiction may decide that the applicable law is the law of the state where the partners have their current habitual residence. Um, in this, uh, in the case of the partnership regulation, uh, the judicial authority can decide that the law of another state, being the state of the last common current habitual residence, applies in uh, the eventualities mentioned in the law. Uh, the choice, Professor can be made expressly or implicitly in both regulations. And we have the, the regulations go into detail how this is to be made. Um, the regulations also provide for a change in the applicable law. So there is, you can start having a marriage or a partnership starting under one law. And then during the course of this um, relationship, the, the parties, the spouses or the parties agree to change and um, the uh, applicable law. And we've got uh, the instances mentioned in Article 22. And we have to be very careful about Article 22, 3, um, uh, because we are usually used to having changes done in a prospective effect from today onwards. But these regulations also provide for changes to be made retrospectively. And I must say, I for one, I, I find that a bit, very, very difficult um, because obviously we as notaries are used um, to build on what is already constructed and not to go back and having a retrospective effect. But uh, that is the law. Um, these are general uh, general provisions. Then we have um, in Article 23, we have the requirements for formal validity, which are very important, okay? Because we, if the, the, uh, the uh, relationship doesn't um, fit into the frame of, as established by the regulation, obviously it is not covered by the regulations. We've got also um, uh, the formal validity of Professor Juris, uh, how, how it is to be made. And Article 24 deals with the consent and material validity of the agreement as to the choice of law. I've already explained that um, the agreement can be limited only to the choice of law and not to the usual um, marriage contract, which we are used to do. Okay. Uh, the formal validity of the matrimonial property agreements is dealt with um, in Article 25, and um, I'm sure we can, you can look it up. 
uh, Article 33 and 34 deal with territorial conflict of laws and interpersonal conflict of laws. The regulations will not apply to internal conflict of rules in states with different laws applying to different parts of the state, for example, in, in, in Spain, where, where they have a very complicated interpersonal conflict of laws. We have also here the um, provision in Article 29 of adaptation of rights in REM, which may not exist in a particular jurisdiction, and the regulations provide for this harmonization, for the adaptation of similar institutes so that the intention of the parties um, is respected, like we have in the succession regulation, we, we have to strive to respect the intention of the testator at all costs. And then in Article 32 uh, provides rules for jurisdiction. Obviously, we as notaries um, are involved um, in, in, in the implementation of these regulations because we are usually the persons which um, our national um, legislation pro, um, entrusts us with drafting these um, matrimonial agreements, either on choice of law or general matrimonial agreements, and also on agreements, regulations, um, partners. Um, then the recital 30 um, deals with about recognition of authentic instruments. We don't need to, to deal with this. I'm sorry, I'm skipping this because I, I want to stick to the time allotted to me. Then um, Article 4 speaks about jurisdiction in the event of the death of one of the spouses or partners. This is more a matter for courts um, which are seized um, with, the, with this problem. Um, and then also jurisdiction, the case of divorce, legal separation, or marriage annulment. And we have um, provisions, special provisions in Article 5.2. Uh, the, the regulations also provide derogations from the rules of jurisdiction. Um, we have Article 8, jurisdiction based on the appearance of the defendant before the court, um, whose law is applicable. Article 9, alter jurisdiction. Article 10, rules where no court has jurisdiction and Article 11, Forum Necessitatis, okay? And uh, we can uh, consult the slides as regards agreement as to choice of law, that I don't need to have to uh, go into it. Thank you very much, and I apologize for taking too much of your time. Thank you.